Welcome back to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast, where you'll find information on what's going on on the North Fork of Long Island. We'll be focusing on issues and opportunities going on in the community, as well as people and stories from the present and the past. I'm your host, Christopher Bianchi, and for episode 21, we have Paul Reeling. He's been living on the on the North Fork for quite a while now, and he talks about his time growing up on the North Fork and moving away and coming back to the North Fork and moving to Greenport and how he got involved in the community. And he talks about his time as the chairman of the East End Seaport Museum and Marine Foundation, and also what he thinks about the future of the area. So I hope you enjoy episode 21 with Paul Creeling. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. You're welcome. Thank you, Chris. So, as I, as with everyone, I like to just start off with an introduction, kind of just tell me where you were born and raised. Okay, uh, my name is Paul Creeling. Um, I am a native of the North Fork, but not Greenport. I was, uh, was born in Queens, but Never remembered anything but Mattituck because I came out before I remember anything. <laughs> that was that. That's pretty good. Um, I was raised in Mattituck. My father was a school teacher in Mattituck High School. Um, he taught there for thirty something years. He's he's got some stories. <laughs> um, and my mother was a housekeeper, housemaker, housemaker, a formidable woman. Um, Really intelligent, well-read, force of nature, Christian scientist, made my upbringing a little different than most. I would say my house was uh, sort of a house of letters. Uh, We had three sets of encyclopedias and and, uh, generally thought the the pun was the highest form of humor. So you can see the dinner conversation were all over the place. Um, they were into nature. Uh, they, my father was into preservation before preservation was happening. Mm-hmm. Again, very intelligent, well-read people, you know, not afraid to get involved. They were located in Queens before yeah, my, they moved? My parents were both from Brooklyn and Queens. My, if you're looking for the ancestor story, my, uh, my father's family was the Schneider Beverage Company, which were one of the first companies to start to flavor salsa water. Mm. Um, I, we had that here. I mean, kissed sodas in the fifties and mm. things like that. There was there was a whole, but he saw the writing on the wall. That things were getting, you know, people they were starting to conglomerate and things were starting to go out. And he got out and came here and became a a church mouse uh, school teacher in Manitouk. <laughs> uh, he taught American history, which might have to do with later on we'll talk about. He taught American history, loved to tell stories. He was also a sailor. You'll, Did, we'll talk about that too. Yes. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I, have, uh, I am currently uh, the curator of the East End Seaport Museum, a uh, former chairman. Uh, I am uh, captain of Easterly Sailing. I have a charter business here. Where I do I teach sailing as opposed to just going out and sailing around, although I do that a lot too. Um, what else have got going on? I'm, I'm an artist. Uh, I've been a teacher in I've been a teacher in South Hall for you know, three or four years, three years, three years, yeah. and uh, I was a graphic designer in New York for many years after going to school here mm-hmm. in Mattatuck High School, which was fun having my father as a teacher. That was interesting. Oh, you had him as a teacher? Oh, actually, in high school I did. But at, in grade school, it had it had its benefits because, you know, you never forgot your lunch money. Uh, you always got a ride to school. I did have perfect attendance. Wouldn't be surprised about that. And, yeah, I, you know, I guess I was, as a, as a kid, I was cut some slack. But then I got into high school, and you know, high school is a little different. You start to be, you're a teacher's a kid, you know, we mm-hmm. need to beat you up and things like that. But I was always, uh, 
a good drawer artist mm -hmm. type. So I always had that sort of escape into into the art department, mm -hmm. so to speak. So it was, you know, I thought my formative upbringing was pretty good. You know, mm -hmm. Pretty good, I think. Although I do think I invented ADD. I'm not sure. But I had good skills. I could draw and I could daydream. Those were really good skills to have. How would you describe, I guess, outside of school, how would you describe Mattituck as a, while you were growing up as a kid? What did you do for fun? Okay, well, Mattituck was interesting. When I was, when I was being raised in Mattituck, as many semi-rural communities at the time were, big changes going on in the 60s there, but we were basically playing was outdoors. Mm. You know? I mean, you went out, and my mother had a bosun's whistle, which she never really mastered, but we knew it was time to come home. Some had bells. I mean, you know, there was, but everybody went out, and there were a group of, core group of kids. Um, it was a young community. There were a lot of people, you know, a lot of young people at that time. Uh, we'd play in the woods. We would, uh, a lot of walking, a lot of walking, because, I mean, things were spread out. There weren't sidewalks. Yeah. Was a lot of walking. There were a lot of farm fields. We would, uh, as youngsters now, I don't know if anyone would even do this nowadays, when we were, I guess, 10 to 12, someplace around there, you know, you'd take a backpack and a sleeping bag and a couple of cans of whatever food you had. Mm -hmm. and you'd say, we're going to the sound. Now, I lived on the bay. So you could walk all the way through farm fields and little roads and things, and you, you know, pilfer a few vegetables on the way or berries or whatever. And you'd go to the sound, try to catch a fish, you'd cook, you'd sleep on the beach, you'd eat sand and your eggs or whatever it was, and the next day you'd walk back. Who would let your 10-year-old or your 12-year-old do it now? I mean, it was pretty safe. You know, yeah. Pretty safe. You'd... I mean, even then, we lived right by Mattituck Airport, and I can remember riding my Stingray to the end of the runway, and people would have to take get their hours, so they'd have to fly a certain amount of time, and you'd, you'd hitchhike, and some guy would take you in their plane. The parents didn't know, and you'd go up, and you'd fly around, and you'd come back down, and he'd let you jiggle things or whatever, and he'd let you off, and you'd get on your bike, and you'd ride home. Mm -hmm. I mean, people go to jail for that now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Different thought process, uh, but we summers were wet. I lived my parents after a number of houses. Um, built a little house on uh, on Deep Hole Creek in in Mattituck. Deep Hole Creek is it's between Mattituck Village, which is James Creek in that area, and New Suffolk. It's like there's a number of bridges, mm -hmm. and it was this just this nice little creek with marshes and all of that. I mean, it was, <laughs> summers were wet, you know, you'd be bumping around. And I believe uh, one becomes a, you become a naturalist by absorption. You know, you know mm -hmm. what this fish is and you know what that bird is and you, you know, you kind of get simpatico to the thing. Well, the 60s was an interesting time and we never really thought about it much, but there were you know, as we're growing up, like summer kids would move in and you'd have, you know, they, they were the wild ones. You'd have fun with them in the summertime. And <laughs> there was water skiing, you know, some kid had a 15 horsepower and you'd water ski right in the creeks and <laughs> crash in the marshes and, you know, not much to worry about. And then they came in and they started improving everything. So, you know, we started getting bulkheads and docks and the creeks were dredged, the county dredged the creeks, and they just wiped out the sort of softness to the edges. Your, mm -hmm. your special climbing spot became eight feet deep, you know what I mean? With it. But they pumped the mud up behind berms, and, mm -hmm. and we'd all play in the mud and paint ourselves up and <laughs> chase boats, you know, run and, run and jump in the water. So, I mean, we didn't realize how environmentally disastrous all of that was because it was the beginning of you know everybody moving out here and changing and it became once the expressway went in and Grumman was happening I mean, it was like 17,000 planes or something like that, it was work and you could live east of work which mm -hmm. is really nice you know I mean that's what was happening yes. here I mean 
Greenport wasn't thriving because of that, because they had all these old houses. And who wanted an old house? I could get a new ranch. So, so Mattituck kind of had that to offer. Mattituck, oh, Kachog, yeah. South Holbeck, there were these developments going mm-hmm. in. And I mean, who, who can fault them? You know, yeah. that's, that's what, that was the style at the mm-hmm. time. That was the thought process, mm-hmm. you know, a new house, you know. But, but uh, I, I found my my childhood growing up was pretty ideal. I mean, we even had an environmental disaster here, beach buggy. We would drive from Mattituck Beach on the Sound all the way to Riverhead and back, and you know, through the beach plums. And oh. Oh, God, who knew? If we knew then what we know now, we we, we wouldn't do it. But um, it was it was great fun. We had a you know great growing up. What was Love Lane like? At that time, or if you can remember some of the places. Well, Love Lane was pretty interesting. I mean, the post office, I mean, people would stop their cars, get out, and go into the post office and come back, and people would just wait. (laughs) 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 It was a different, the hardware store was the center of the world there. That was still there on the corner. Where Orlowski's was, or whatever the name it was. I forget the name of it. But that was that was like you know that was where the guys stood around and talked and the world mm-hmm. got saved. It was Dolly Bell lived in town when I was a young man. Dolly Bell, famous, I guess, peconic bay painter, mm-hmm. excellent teacher of, of Alexander Graham Bell. That, mm-hmm. that Bell, you know, didn't have to worry about money. <laughs> she was a character. But the town was the town. Mattituck, I guess, was a village, um, like Greenport's a village, South Oaks. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was pretty, uh, I mean, we had a bowling out. That was cool. Mm-hmm. You know? But we did a lot of walking. Yeah. You know, good friends from all over town, you'd walk. You'd mm-hmm. just walk. You know? Yeah. It was what you did in high school. You know? mm-hmm. um, I wasn't, there was some sports. The town, you know, excuse me, the school had a pretty good soccer team and championships or whatever there's i wasn't involved in sports i was not i guess a team player <laughs> <laughs> what activity well, what activities or clubs or you said the arts well i was in I, the art department was really mm-hmm. it wasn't an art club i mean mm-hmm. we think of we think when we think of art if we think of art clubs and we think of yes i was on the drama thing. Mm-hmm. i made me cut my hair for a play I was very upset. um yeah, it, it was small town. I mean, mm-hmm. I had, I think my graduating class was 80, mm. and I don't think they all made it. <laughs> so it was, it was, I don't know really, the, the, I don't remember the actual numbers, but we had, our classes were all sorts of, we had, you know, farm kids, and we had, we had... Uh, like, was it, did you have kids coming out from the city at that time? Not really. I, I don't think it was, it was the... I guess there were a few that came out, but it really wasn't. It wasn't the flux that we have now. It wasn't, mm-hmm. you know, and and we didn't really have. We didn't really have uh, an immigrant population. We had. Mm-hmm. We had. I mean, we had black people. We had white people. We had you know different nationalities, but it wasn't. It wasn't. It didn't seem that broken up. You know, it didn't seem in terms of like ethnicity or like yeah, you it had was, Polish, it to be, yeah, Italian. Yeah, yeah, everybody, you know, everybody joked about the Polish farmers, and you know, that, that, that was the stupid jokes. That was the yeah. thing. It wasn't, but there wasn't. It was truly a farming farming community. I mean, my next door neighbor's father worked for Agway selling chemicals to the potato farmers. I mean, it was potato farms out here. We used to. You know, they used to spray the things with DDT, and we used to ride our bikes behind. I mean, you know, the way you think of these things that yeah. you did as a kid, you know, spray for mosquitoes. Oh, great. You know, chase them with your bike. Oh, ride with the car. <laughs> <laughs> you just, you, but, you know, it was smoke. It was, yeah. you, you didn't think about it. And, and that, was, uh, that was an interesting time because that was the transition from potato farming, which was huge out here. I mean, mm-hmm. the ciders and the, everybody was it was it was it was huge. They were mm-hmm. king potatoes and that changed with I believe I want to say the Transportation Act that happened in I guess it was in happened start, but there was one every every few years yeah. there was a transportation act. But one of them is they built the highway system and the highway system oh. basically wasn't that Eisenhower? Yeah, the, 
Eisenhower got the inner the, and then and then Lyndon Johnson yeah. and the, well well that's when the expressway came in but mm -hmm. also that also went all over the world so all over the mm -hmm. country so you could get Idaho potatoes for the same price mm -hmm. as you could get you know Greenport potatoes or whatever and that started the tumbling I think there was other I'm sure there were more facts than I know but that was a change and that's when you know Hargraves came out and we started the lines mm -hmm. and. And people were now their their houses that they built in the sixties. Now their kids are growing up, and now they're using it. Oh well, let's just move out. There. It was there was a just a march of people, and with people come needs, and with needs come services. Mm -hmm. you know, and it changed, our economy changed dramatically. I mean, mm -hmm. just that's that's the one thing that changed out here: more people, and you know that's what changed before the. Well, I guess you were still pretty young when the Long Island Express. Well, the Long Island Express. When I was a kid, I can remember we'd drive to we'd go see my grandparents on Sunday, who lived in Kew Gardens, and we'd have Sunday dinner, and then we'd drive back and be late at night, and then exit seventy. All of a sudden, it's like <laughs> the lights went off and the <laughs> roads disappeared. It was you know, and then it was my dad driving, with, trying to stay on the road. What about the? The Long Island Railroad, would you take that in? No, well, actually, that was an interesting time for the Long Island Railroad because of, because maybe because of the expressway and the car and mm -hmm. all of those. The Long Island, at one point, the Long Island Railroad stopped coming to Greenport. I mean, mm -hmm. There was a whole road and rail thing. I, I'm not, I'm sure that Don Fisher has more <laughs> facts than I do about that. <laughs> But it stopped for a while there, and it was there was a bus. You take a bus to Ron Conkoma, and then yeah. go from there. But it, the whole North Fork was changing. Mm -hmm. It was changing from agrarian to a suburb, basically. I mean, it, I think that's a, we'd love to say, oh, we live in the country, but I mean, Greenport Village is a planned town. It's got a planned village, I guess a village, I guess a village. It's got yeah. X's, you know. <laughs> yeah. so first, second, third, you know. Somebody made a plan there. And uh, unlike most of the other villages, I think Amy touched on this a little bit. The road's going all over the place. I mean, this was a pretty forward-thinking village. I mean, we mm -hmm. had a power plant and we had sewer and water and I, I mean, pretty forward-thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, and they're still working. Mm -hmm. That's that's a that's a wonderful thing. I left when I left, you know, after after high school out here. Everybody goes to college, and like the brain drain that was out here. I mean, I'd say I went to school, in New York State School, as far away from here as I could. I ended up going to Fredonia, which is as far as you can go in New York State, well, north and upstate. north and west, you know, oh. north and west. Which interestingly was wine country. Who knew I mm -hmm. fell into the same thing again? But uh, I studied art there. It was music and art school, a state school. Was that something you knew you wanted to do coming out of high school? You wanted to go into the arts. I was, I, I was, uh, I was of mixed thought processes. I would, you know, I mean, of course, the the romantic part was being an artist. So that was wonderful. But I also really. I really enjoyed science, and, mm -hmm. that's, and it was really good. I mean, uh, this is this is a little bit of urban myth, but I was the only one in New York State who got a hundred on the biology regents when I took the I mean, <laughs> that may be a lie, but I'm sticking with it. <laughs> <laughs> I was, you know, I was throwing it around whether I could, you know, I could draw a little amoebas and I could draw a little stuff. I could work for Woods Hole and go that route. You know, mm -hmm. he, both routes didn't seem to be. I was not headed for fame and fortune. <laughs> Either way, it was going to be a struggle. But I went into the arts because well, I had a good portfolio and I mm -hmm. could go into the arts. And I did. And I studied fine art, um, printmaking and photography. And uh, after school, as most people do, you come back home. But before I think you mentioned before that when you when you were going off to college you you wanted to leave you wanted to get as far away well yeah the idea was to was to you know everybody was leaving everybody was leaving I, unfortunately I mean maybe it was my youth maybe it was my upbringing maybe it was just 
just uh, a laziness, but I felt that I was really, I mean, like a salmon, I was pretty imprinted in this place. I, you know, this, it was, anybody talked about anything, it was always about, I talked about here because it was mm-hmm. special. And, and I wanted to, uh, I mean, how, how bad is sailing, swimming, farm fields? I mean, pretty nice. <laughs> pretty, and freedom. Complete for you know, blow the whistle, come home from you know, that was that was pretty to me. That's pretty idyllic upbringing, you know. I mean, but as someone growing up there and then getting out of high school, I think maybe some people might not realize it, or they'll come back later, they'll eventually move back later. But they want a change coming out of high school, maybe. I, you know, it wasn't. It wasn't so much run away. It was run to something else. I wanted, I wanted a bigger experience. I wanted to, you know, the idea was, oh, I'm going to go to New York City and be a famous artist. I mean, that was the, that was the myth that everybody had. And, you know, you read the books and you mm-hmm. know, well, oh, Paris, you know, all of that stuff. And I mean, I was under informed and over enthusiastic about my uh, what you could do as an artist. And uh, and how much work it took. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what you, you know, you don't get something for nothing. So I went to school for that, and I was a kind of enthralled with graphic design at the time. I liked, you know, we had we did a bunch of movie posters, and I was always I liked lettering. And my father had incredible handwriting. I mean, he couldn't mm-hmm. spell, but but he could, it would look good. And I emulated his handwriting and I put my handwriting and <laughs> not anything on this sheet. I was, you know, I liked, I was kind of proud of my handwriting. I couldn't spell either, just to, just keep it in. <laughs> but I ended up doing some posters and things like that, but didn't really think about what I was going to do for a living. And I was a pretty good illustrator and I had gotten a few little jobs illustrating. I, you know, so I was all cocky about that, but, you know, what do you do in between, you know? So when I came back to, uh, from college, I, uh, I got a job on the Mattatuck Traveler Watchman. It's no longer here, but that was in, oh, the, that was in the newspaper in Southold. And I did all the ads. So I was typing out the little things and gluing and pasting and waxing and pasting them together and doing the ads and spelling them poorly and that was that's all that's time consuming. It was time compared consuming compared to now. Well yeah, but but that's how it was done. I mean you didn't know that in fact it was a lot faster than than it was before. It was getting previous better. Yeah, it was getting better and better. <laughs> you know? And then I went and then I worked on I went from there, I went to the East Hampton Star and I moved on I did a Few newspapers, Southampton Press, uh, mm-hmm. East Hampton Star, you know, Shelter and Report, whatever. But I was doing the ads and a little bit of the layout, and I was kind of enjoying this graphic design. This is all before computer. It was mm-hmm. sort of typesetting, but there really wasn't computer work. So I put together a portfolio of things that I did, and uh, I answered an ad in the New York Times, and I got a job at a publisher doing book covers and things like that, mm-hmm. which is Grosset and Dunlop. I don't even know if they're still around Grosset and Dunlop. I mean, they have... I've, I've seen books of theirs published, but not recently. Yeah, yeah they did. They had a sci-fi thing. They had uh, Platinum Monk with Children's. They had... But I got to work on a number of these these books, and it was, mm-hmm. it was, it was great. It was great fun. I learned mm-hmm. an awful lot. I mean, and there was a bit of a shake-up in the art department, blah, 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 blah. And the next thing you know, I was art director of Gross and Dunlop. I was not qualified. <laughs> um. But I did it for six months or whatever, and I found another another job that actually paid better, and I did annual reports for a number of years. This um, was in New York City? In New York. In New York. Uh, I was living in Jersey City. You know, um, another I was a pioneer. <laughs> <laughs> what year was that that you were living in Jersey City? Oh, I think that was. Uh, I would say that would be late seventies, early eighties. Mm. Uh, late seventies, I, I think. I yeah. How would you describe the area? Well, it's interesting. Jersey City. I have a friend of mine had from Mattatuck had moved in there, and I went and became his roommate. Where he found this place and. It was, it was in Jersey City was a small town that got big. 
had a lot of little cultural areas and I lived on the entrance to a park. So it was quite, quite grand, overgrown. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, uh, let's say my building used to have a doorman. <laughs> it was one of those, <laughs> those pre-war things. I mean, we had a, we had a frame, no awning, but we had a frame. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of fell apart after yeah, we, had, we had an elevator that most of the, you know, like, <laughs> worked with the cage. Yeah. The old, oldest ones, that was, that was actually fun. Uh, but I lived on the edge of this park and I walked a mile to, to the station and then mm -hmm. took the path train to New York. And anyway, so I worked in, I worked in annual reports for a while. And, uh, I actually having coming, I'd come out on, I'd come out on weekends and uh, I had a car that, uh, let's just say it was broken into so many times. I just didn't even lock it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it was just, just. <laughs> the radio was gone. It didn't matter. Just drive it anyway. And um, I'd come out. I'd come out on weekends, and I actually met a young lady out here. And I, I married a lady from South Hold, a local woman, and we moved back to the city. And uh, at that time, I decided <laughs> I decided to go off on my own. It was the eighties. It was mm -hmm. the, this is now. This is before computers. So once you first to do that, you had to have a whole network of people, the typesetters and printers and all, all of these people. You had to have this. And I had kind of set that up already just from working with annual reports. And um, I met with a group of designers and we opened a sort of a collective. And it was pretty interesting. We all got work, all different work. I mean, there was industrial work. There was theater work. There was, uh, I had uh, catalog work. Well, we did all sorts of sorts of things. I mean, I designed the 92nd Street Y logo. Who knew? I did uh, the original City Harvest logo. I mean, at one point, I was doing posters for Twyla Tharp. Now, this is the, this is the <laughs> Xerox machine. Yes. <laughs> and, and this was the, the inkling, the beginning of computers. I had Club Med for a client for a year. I mean, it was, oh, wow. it was, I had some pretty, we had some pretty, I mean, I wasn't doing the top, top stuff, but I was doing their support stuff. And You wanted to get, you wanted, it was kind of nice to do this other collective instead of working for annual. Well, it was a way of being independent and still having a support group. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody, I was... I would do the paste up for a friend of mine who had that, or he would do the paste up for me. <laughs> or, yeah. I mean, we were, we were, you know, I, I would run messenger. I would be a messenger. He would be a messenger. Mm -hmm. um, but it was pretty good. We had a full dark room. Mm -hmm. We had a full floor on Gansworth Street. Boy, do that now. Gansworth Street, second floor on Gansworth Street, home of the meat packers and transvestites. It was, it was an interesting mm -hmm. time, you know. The letters would run with blood, <laughs> and uh, and that was from chickens. <laughs> but I did that for quite a while. Uh, I ended up doing some freelance also. I ended up mm -hmm. working for an advertising agency who were this was long, quite a while ago. But um, and they were doing some catalog work, and uh, it was pretty interesting. I mean, the principal of the advertising agency owner died with no provisions to what was going to happen with his company so i was the art director and the other guy was the creative director we just divvied up the clients <laughs> which was i mean i had all right i had gloria vanderbilt armstrong floors and a few other I ended up with but i ended up with um some pretty good Stuff I ended up working with the creative director for a number of years. We got a, uh, uh, you've all heard of Hart Schaffner and Marx. I mean, that was a big clothing company. Well, they had divisions, and their divisions were like Barry Pace was for women's, lovely women's clothes, you know, quality yeah. clothing. And it turned into, I because I was a drawer, I do these layouts. Now, this mm -hmm. Before computers, I did mm -hmm. tissue layouts, and I'd figure out what cloth was going to be there, and how the shoes were going to be on the page, and how much copy was going to be there. And uh, I did pretty good with that. That was that was a pretty good gig. I ended up meeting a lot of photographers and friends, and, and then 
one golden afternoon, I was uh, I was out here, and my friends, my high school friends, we went sailing. To, every year, we'd take a boat, and we'd sail. And we'd go to Sag Harbor in October and, and be silly. And uh, it was it was like golden sunshine. Mm -hmm. Weather was just spectacular. I was like, what am I doing in Jersey City? When you could be out. When I could be out here in God's country. Well, mm -hmm. You know, everybody thinks phone, fax, and FedEx. You know, <laughs> yeah, we can do this. Uh, well, I, I closed my business, and uh, at, at that point, I had oh, I had like almost seventeen freelance employees, I and mean, a lot of people. It was a busy organization. Well, I stepped out of the organization. It sort of it was it sort of collapsed after that, but mm -hmm. I, I wasn't there for it. I stepped out of that business and came out here and. Bought a computer and taught myself how to do computer graphics, and was doing some catalog work. And uh, I, I had clients in New Jersey, and and I was doing some traveling in California. And I had to do some traveling mm -hmm. to keep the money coming in, and, and I slowly, I slowly went broke. But in that period of time, I moved to Kutchow to South Old. I bought a house in Greenport. Now Greenport in 1989 and 1990 was a hard HUD target area. I mean, it was mm -hmm. pretty rough, but I saw Greenport as just, it was really cool. I mean, it came from, <laughs> from Jersey City. I liked the, I liked the cultural diversity of it, mm -hmm. and it wasn't too dear, you know, and everybody was sort of on the same economic level. It was kind of, mm -hmm. but buildings were beautiful, the water mm -hmm. was great. So I moved out here and started to raise, I had, uh, with this uh, Eileen Chilton, the Chilton family is pretty big. There's a lot of them out here. We raised three kids out here. Mm -hmm. uh, now everybody has the story of heartache and there was a divorce and there were some other things that mm -hmm. went on in there. But I want to give my kids what I had. Pack them up. Let's walk across. You couldn't do it. You couldn't walk from Beta Sound without stepping on people's property or without... The farmers getting mad at you, we had fences, we was gone. What I had as a kid was gone. Mm -hmm. Now, it's still pretty bucolic and the water is still great and stuff, but it's changed. It's very different now. And that has snowballed. I mean, you try to do that now. I mean, deer fencing alone would stop you. But we raised three kids. They all, you know, we would, all went to Greenport High and as long as they could. You know, my youngest was a bit of a hellion. And, uh, and that was, which endears me to him very much. But they all did fairly well. And they all, but they all left. There's no, nobody, nobody's here now. They're in Brooklyn and Colorado. They wanted to, to leave after. You couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't live here. The, mm -hmm. A, there was no work. I and mean, this is what, what was happening. We went from an agrarian fishing community, which was lovely, but it wasn't viable any longer. Things changed, things changed. Then we went through that weird period of what, what are we? And the service industry, the people came in and it became, we are now a service industry out here. We're not, we love to say that we're a fishing port. We love to say we are, you know, we are a boating community. Mm -hmm. It's more of a summer house boating community. Fishing is still, there's still fishing going on, especially in the sound. The sound is viable. You know, there's still stuff going on. But it's changed. It's changed. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I mean, when I came out, when I came out here and moved to Greenport, I was still doing graphic, you know, still doing graphic design, converted my barn to a studio. Well, oh, my goodness, you know, how metropolitan. <laughs> 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 but I made a reasonable living. I wasn't killing it. And then we sort of like disintegrated and I went back to New York and I ended up working on magazines and, and a few other things and decided that I wanted to get my teaching degree because, well, my father was a teacher and, and it looked like I could live out here and teach. So I went and got my teaching degree from Dowling. No, yeah, it was Dowling at the time. Dowling. Yeah. And uh, first place I interviewed, which was South Old Town. Uh, South Hill School, I got the job. I was like, that was easy. You mm -hmm. know? And uh, I, I loved it. I taught for four years. I loved it. I mean, I brought a lot of energy. I was pretty energetic. I brought in computers and I tried to, and I taught photography and I taught, but I was teaching K through 
K through two, seven and eight, and mm-hmm. high school photography. I mean, it was a bit of a stretch. And I was, but at the time I had met, I met a uh, Peggy Lover. <laughs> <laughs> well, that changed things. But were you living in Greenport? I, at that time, I was actually living in Greenport. When I first came back to Greenport, I actually had, I lived in the, the Mills building, which is, you know, the, the one right on the corner there. I had, a, mm-hmm. I, had a, I was an artist. I could get a, I had a really nice loft in there. It was great. Mm-hmm. My kids would drop water balloons on people. <laughs> it was, it was, we reconnected. No, I was I had met Poppy Johnson there and she was living in the building. So it was it was it was an interesting time. I mean I had I was using I was doing catalogs at the time. I was using Greenport as a location for photography and you know, it was sort of we stayed at the Silver Sands. I mean it was it was pretty fun. It was pretty fun. But as I became a school teacher I could, I couldn't afford that. I bought it, I rented another little place. And that's how I met Peggy in the neighborhood. And uh, I taught there for a while, and I took, then I took a summer job because she had summers off, working at uh, what was Brewers at the time. No, Brewers, Brewers Shipyard. Brewers yes. Shipyard. It was Brewers. Now it's Safe Harbor, but it's the same physical plant. And I loved working on sailboats. And I became, you know, I could play with sailboats. How cool mm-hmm. is that? And I was probably making the same amount as I was making as a teacher. <laughs> but I went, then I, I, I made the, uh, I went back to school full time to get my, to get my master's and, uh, left the teaching job. Well, there was a little window there. It was tough to get a job. I ended up, you know, it's like interviewing and interviewing and like, you know, Mastic Beach and things like that. And I was like, no, I kind of, I was kind of spoiled teaching in Southall. I really don't want to, I don't want to be a behaviorist. I just want to teach art. So I stuck with the shipyard for quite a long time. Very interested in the maritime. I mean, you're in the water. You're sailing around Greenport. Greenport's fascinating from the water. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is. You walk around, you see all the cool houses and stuff, and you think history. Go out on the water. I mean, it is. Things falling down and docks are changing, like, mm-hmm. you know, dentures. But that was that was pretty neat. Greenport was in a place of change. That j- everything was changing. I mean, mm-hmm. it was. I mean, the, the Mitchell Park was being built. I mean, it used to be Kokomo was there. I mean, when I first came here in the nineteen ninety, I guess it was a blight. But I didn't really think of it as a blight. The sun was shining and the water was sparkling, and you know, maybe compared to Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> maybe a little bit, of that. but I always, but I, but I always, I mean, I don't know. You you walk into Clark's yard, you you go. I've always liked the the rough edges. I mean, there was something charming about that, and, and that, that you you feel history in your hand. I mean, that's mm-hmm. probably how I got involved with the, the museum. In fact, it is how I got involved with the museum. I would sail, I would sail all the time. I mean, mm-hmm. I had a boat, blah, 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 fix up boats and you sail them and sail them and sell them. And, and it was, it was good. I mean, it wasn't, mm-hmm. I wasn't killing it, but I had a new girlfriend and I was happy. <laughs> it was all good. And, uh, uh, and uh, I would sail past Bug Light and I was like, Bug Light? What a cool, what's, you know, I was here in 1990 when I, I stood there and watched them launch it onto the thing. It did, <laughs> I, I had no idea. I mean, I had no connection beforehand. I mean, Greenport was where you go when I was a little kid. You'd go to Brandy's Shoes and you'd get Buster Browns. And that was Greenport mm-hmm. for me. I mean, you know, Myers Bar, if you really go to the dark side. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had no real connection to Greenport when I first moved here. I got, I got a connection very quickly. I mean, Greenport was trying to come back. I don't know if any of you, if you remember, I had like one of my first jobs was for the, was for the, uh, the rotary. I did a map of Greenport, enamel, enamel steel map, you know, mm-hmm. you put them around the village. I had to do these little drawings. It was, I mean, I did a walking tour of Greenport. I think they still got it online. All those little oh. drawings, those are mine. That's what I, that's. Wow. And then it was first night in the nineties. I guess it was the, first night. First, that was two thousand and one. I think two thousand and one was first night. That's mm. when they had the you know, that's all the Christmas decorations, the mm. shooting stars, and the boat. They were all made for first night. 
they had ice sculptures, and it was a, it was a, a, a non-drinking New Year's Eve that everybody, all the shops were open, and every, I mean, they did that for two years. I did all the posters and stuff for that. I mean, I was did the artwork. I wasn't the one the organizer of it. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so the we go, <laughs> I do uh, I go, and I'm selling past the lighthouse, and the lighthouse is looking a little, you know, a little sad on the corners. And I'd like to get involved to fix that up. That would be great. You know, it'd be like a feather in your cap, you know. <laughs> and I said, well, it's the museum, you know, I think the museum owns it. Okay. Uh, that was the East End Seaport Museum. That's the East End Seaport Museum and Marine Foundation. And Marine. Don't forget the Marine Foundation, because that's going to come into play in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went into the museum, and it uh, had a sort of a dusty mausoleum quality. I mean, they were doing, they were doing stuff. They mm-hmm. were doing stuff displays up and things like that and they were telling stories but I coming as a graphic designer from blah 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 I had a bigger vision right away mm-hmm. but came in and I went to join the board and the board was having some issues at that time I would profess to I didn't you know <laughs> I wasn't there long enough to understand what the problem was I knew yeah. what the solution was and they took care of that everybody quit <laughs> So I sort of like didn't get my hand down in time, and I became the chairman of the board, which was kind of interesting. Well, chairman of the board was kind of interesting in an organization with you know like no checks and balances. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, I was first. I was a little flabbergasted. Like I was like, oh, what? I've never done curating. I've never been a museum person. I've never, you know. I mean, all right. My father was <laughs> taught history. <laughs> Great. I don't know how to tell the story. But I was like, what am I going to do here? You know? So the first thing I did was I took everything off the walls and I painted all the walls. I figured, start from zero. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty incredible to come into a village and, um, you know, from what everybody knew me. I was a sailboat guy. I was a sailor artist guy. I mean, to be given the keys to a old railroad station, historic building that is a museum, and the keys to a lighthouse. I was like, oh, how lucky am I? <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. Thank you very much. This is this is this only hurts when I breathe. <laughs> um, I was like, okay, well, I'll do something with it. And I was, I just ran at it. Mm-hmm. And then I ran at it as hard as I could, you know, and. Uh, Tried to tell, I said, well, we got to have a show. What's a show? Well, I went and I went to the archives and I was like, duh, uh, what does this mean? You know, have, mm-hmm. we've heard the stories of bunker and fishing. I mean, we know, we know the stories and there's stuff up there, but it wasn't it, it wasn't in presentable form. Mm. There was a lot of like, well, where does this go? Was it organized or just kind of stored? Um well, there was, there's a, there's a number of systems to, you know, you guys got the Dewey Decimal System, mm-hmm. and I believe Amy talked about this. Well, there's a, there's a program. Well, garbage in, garbage out, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. You can assign a number and you can assign it, but if you don't know what it is, it's like picture of boat. Mm-hmm. In, where is it? It's in pile A on the shelf. There's pile A. Well, the pile has fallen over. Somebody has gone to, you know, it was, it was okay. There was an awful lot of uh, forensic work, mm. <laughs> lack of a better word, maybe <laughs> forensic was the word, exploration. But the first year I was there, I said, okay, well, first thing we have to do is we have to make ourselves, this is with the, the, you know, we actually we had to off, I had to get a friend to join the board so we'd have quorum so I could get elected as chairman. So it was, it was pretty rough. But the museum has had some hard times and some things disappeared. And let's not, you know, not, I'm, I'm casting no aspersions because it's a wonderful organization. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't know how to reach out to the community. So I said, well, I'll just say, okay, what was a pivotal year? You know, uh, I'm sure everyone in the viewing audience, so, uh, 
knows of that one postcard of Mitchell Park with all the wooden boats in it and the, yes. you know, that, yes. that that sort of semi colorized so I looked at that and I said, Well, this is a really good starting place. And I said, Oh, sixties. Okay, this is the sixties. This is what this place this is Mitchell's burned down in seventy three or seventy six or someplace in there. I mean, mm-hmm. There's but 1960s. Wow, wow. 1960s. That has a good. That has a kind of a cool look. Cool bathing suits and you mm-hmm. know, you know, cool boats. And, and I said, all right, well, let's reach out to the community and say, where were you in the 60s? So I put together some ads, and I had an old Evan Mood ad. You know, the boat going with the water ski. You know, that mm-hmm. kind of like we're trying to evoke a little response. Well, I put that out there and it was like radio silence. <laughs> I was like, oh no, what am I going to do? But then it started and I called friends and did the next, the next thing you know, I've got, you know, gasoline signs and clothing and cypress garden water skis and more fishing lures than you can shake a stick at pictures of people water skiing and stories Mm -hmm. little stories little vignette stories which i find really evocative i mean Mm -hmm. if i go to a museum i like the little stories the little stories are fun because you're only there for a little bit absorb a little thing come back absorb something else that was the idea so anyway so i put this show together and uh, it was pretty well received you know i mean i started to one of the things was kind of interesting and this is last year's um uh grand marshal was was skip goldsmith well i went to skip goldsmith and i said you know got any motors he's just thinking you know well he goes oh yeah come with me and he goes he walk into the back of his and there is like Oh, it's all these all these, <laughs> all all, motors. All these but they're all work. They all work. And I was like, wow. So borrowed two little stands and two little motors, and we brought them there, and we put them in the museum, and it was like grand opening. All the guys were standing around talking about the motors. <laughs> and, you know, it was. You know, it turned out to be a pretty big hit. So. If you go to the East End Seaport Museum and Maritime Panda, you will see a collection of motors that were all gleaned from local people's basements and things. I just called around and <laughs> people just said, oh, yeah, I got one of these. I got one of those. And they tell stories about them. And, the, and so they lent me these motors and I put them up. And um, it adds a certain... And I mean, they are beautiful. I mean, old motors are kind of cool to look at. Yeah. And two of them work. I try to figure out which two they are. That's that's your next assignment. <laughs> um, but the, I brought the motors in, and, and I start to clean up the displays. And I told the story of oysters, and I, which was wonderful, reaching out to the community about anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is a wonderful community. People will tell you stuff. It's not nobody's you know, nobody's hiding anything unless you talk about, about prohibition. Then then <laughs> you're not going to get all the stories. But it was it was wonderful. I got so much so much help from everybody as far as doing the story in the oyster industry. I had, I mean, Ram Little Ram Oysters did a video. I mean, they mm-hmm. did it for something else, but we included it in there. Somebody gave me a. A oyster cage with a different thing, explanation. I had Cornell Cooperative. They helped me. I built a, you know, how they grow algae. Mm-hmm. Well, algae is grown in these big tanks and they're green and brown and all of this. So I went to Surgical Supply and I bought all these stuff in a fish pump and I used food coloring because I didn't have any, I didn't want to do algae. And I grew this, I built this thing that bubbled and it was, it was theater, but it was telling the story and it got people asking questions. And I got a lot of facts and I tried to string them together into a loose chronological order. Um, Unlike uh, much history in museums and things like that, they, they, all the facts are lined up. I, the facts I use the facts as 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 much as I have, but there's gaps in between them. So I rely on opinion and and to try to tell a cohesive story. It's the story that is the presentation. The individual facts they're there. Right now, there's one up, up on the bunker industry and 
I have to be, uh, I have to do a little shout out to uh, Pat Mundus, who is just, just a wonderful, I don't know you should interview her. She is just a font of information and a good researcher. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, as she was involved with the museum a number of years ago. I, I, I won't even, I, dates? I don't know dates. I'm just a, <laughs> I'm a curator. <laughs> anyway, uh, she was real helpful with information. So she, I just took every, all the information every gave me, I stirred it up in a pot, and I applied graphic design. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how I've been approaching it ever since. And I'm trying to breathe life into the museum because when I first started, remember the lighthouse? Mm -hmm. I want to fix the lighthouse up. Well, you had just done a, uh, an interview with Dinny Gordon. Her husband, Michael Keating, I was talking to him about it. He said to me, he was a smart man, he said, first you gotta fix the museum. And I was like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so I did, I leaned into that and I did what I could. I mean, I, well, there's many people involved in this, it's not just me, I mean, I, I was, I'm the creative, I'm the idea guy and run around guy, but there's a lot of stuff that has to be done in the office and keeping the money straight and running the maritime festival, which I do not do, just to let you know. This just, this, there's a lot of people involved. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, we can always use more volunteers. We can pitch there. Uh, we can always use more volunteers. It's a fun, fun organization. There's, um, when I first started, 19, I mean, excuse me, 2019, it was pretty rough. I mean, it was pretty, you know, stuff wasn't where it was supposed to be. You couldn't find stuff in the file cabinets. I mean, volunteer organizations do have a tendency to degrade unless mm -hmm. you have someone, like, running the ship. And anyway, so this has all been upgraded, and we're, we've reached a point where my, <laughs> my enthusiasm in running around and doing, and, and just running at it, screaming, uh, it, the organization is more organized than that now. They, they don't need that sort of uh, that sort of uh, frippery, I should say. <laughs> it's a frippery word. <laughs> but now, so I have now my term was up uh, according to our bylaws, mm -hmm. and I have to take a year off off the board. I haven't diminished what I'm doing. Remember, this is all volunteer. I'm not working for them. And there's no renewer. We, yes. we, whatever, no pay. Um, so I really kind of leaned. In fact, I ended up leaving, retiring from the shipyard so that I could lean into this a little bit more. Yeah. Um, it's been very rewarding. But, yeah. So, so now, uh, as I finish with the museum, I'm still going to be curating and being involved as a creative stuff for this year, uh, I have focused, it is focused with a new, we have a new um, chairman, Sarah Sands, and we have a new executive director. And I mean, it's becoming a real, as a museum, real organization should be. And with, we are having, we have a, we started a children's program a couple of years ago, and now that is growing. That's in a, that's coming up in the summer. That'll be there. Can, eight sessions, I believe. We're also doing a. Uh, we're going to do a. If we can work it out, it's this experimental at this point. We're going to do an adult camp, which is kind of fun. I mean, you know, <laughs> why should the kids have all the fun? You know, you know, you know, let's go walk around in the marsh. So, you know, I mean, adults you know, love this. They, that's yes. why people moved out here, mm -hmm. and that is the marine foundation part. Mm -hmm. We also have a winter lecture series going on right now. I mean, there's one coming up in, in, in February. But we started, I started doing these lecture series during COVID to keep our name out there. So we had these Zoom presentations that, you know, we get 50 people or whatever. It was, it was great. It was great. It brought the level up and I think repaired our reputation in a little bit. You know, I, mean, I can't take all credit because it's not all me. But it got going. We still have cruises to the lighthouse, which is mm -hmm. which is terrific. It's I mean, I don't know if you've gone. I haven't gone yet. You've got to go. You've got to go. If, for the view alone, for the view alone, you know, watch where you step. But 
<laughs> but the view alone it is the uh i mean to me the lighthouse is like if you said greenport period mm -hmm. it would be the period you know it's like that's the that's it was built in in 1990 it was rebuilt because it had burned down mm -hmm. it was rebuilt in 1990 as sort of a rallying point as greenport was starting to you know, say, wait a minute, we're not going down any. We're not going down. We're coming back. It was sort of a rallying point, and uh, Greenport has been going up ever since. And, it's, and fortunately, with the with the lighthouse and its its remoteness and the expense and things like that, it's sort of like a portrait of Dorian Gray as, <laughs> as the village comes up. The, the lighthouse is going going down, and that is my focus now. We're in the very beginning of a well, we've been capital toying with capital campaign mm -hmm. but we're getting very serious now i mean i've got bathymetric surveys i've got engineers reports i've got uh getting estimates for build rebuilding it and architects involved and it's i mean all we're missing is the money and, yeah. and that i mean there is there is a it's not a hard it's not a hard launch yet we're looking for the big guy anybody got a lot of money uh, come on in. <laughs> we could use some we could use some support it's a wonderful thing but that you said the lighthouse was rebuilt in 1990 well the lighthouse uh you know, the, the this is the part of the uh, uh the myth of the lighthouse it originally was built in 1871 Eight, now 1871 was an amazing time in in uh american history industrial revolution mm -hmm. i mean we had the train out here in the 1840s, and mm -hmm. so that came out here. So we were a transportation hub. People would mm -hmm. take the steamers and they'd go to, well, they'd have to go past the, the sandbar there. And, and, and we had, I mean, this is when the, you know, the bunker industry was happening. Whaling had finished at that point, 1860s, whaling was done. But there was still an infrastructure for, mm -hmm. the, for this that was here that was thriving and boat building. And it was, it was it was a real this was a city as far as I mean, <laughs> small but, <Yeah. laughs> but but it had all the bits and pieces it had boat building and it had it had a uh, fishing industry and it had uh, farming and the transportation and there was a whole schooner trade that mm -hmm. went around i mean the coastal schooners that's i mean we were almost more connected to connecticut than we were to new york just cuz mm -hmm. it's closer <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> But but there was a whole bunch of there's a whole you know I mean a whole bunch of people had these founding fathers so to speak they were making all the money because they were the traders you know mm -hmm. I mean names of names of streets and names of uh, you know or named after boats and um, people made a lot of money now the same people who made money from whaling were, you know the bunker industry came in and the bunker industry was a big deal mm -hmm. it was a big this is when they started pressing it into oil because. This was, I mean, Shelter Island. Uh, Shelter Island, uh, the the east side of Shelter Island was a lot of processing plants, mm -hmm. you know. And, and then they built the big one on on Long Beach. That big one, they built that big fertilizer plant that was they squeeze the oil out, and then they take the fish, and they would mix the phosphate into the fish, and it would go on a ship mm -hmm. or on the train, and that's what was. Going down to, to the cotton fields. I was going to the cotton fields, raise the cotton because mm -hmm. everybody was farming like it was no tomorrow, mm -hmm. taking everything. It was before Monsanto decided to poison us all. A oh, little editorial there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a big deal. I mean, mm -hmm. we saw 1870s, right? And uh, get steel, and they you know, wasn't it Belmer, the, the blast furnace, 1870-something? Mm. That was when they would make steel as opposed to iron and an iron railroad. Yeah. Yeah, it just, it, uh, America was growing and fishing was good and farming was good and transportation was good. We were we were happening then. A lot of lighthouses were built then. In mm. fact, from recent research, we look at Bug Light and you know Bug Light with its Victorian there were five of them. They were all that that's design number twenty six, by the way. Mm. That was design number twenty six. Well, it burned down and it was abandoned during the war. Thirty eight hurricane wasn't good to it either. But it was it was 
abandoned or they're decommissioned in 1948, but it was really, it was turned off during the war and never turned back on. Mm. It was decommissioned in 48, sat there as a um, an icon, that <laughs> is to say, a relic, a, a, yeah, a relic, an icon, <laughs> a, a place to go with a six pack of Rhine Gold and a pack of Fall Ball. <laughs> um, it was just hanging out there, and then it got burned down in 1963. Arson, kids being kids, yes, all of the above, burned to the ground. Big loss. The community didn't realize how cool it was until it was gone. You know, like, mm-hmm. you know we've heard that story before. Well, it sat there as a foundation until 1990, and one of the Merle Wiggins, I don't know, Merle Wiggins, he was one of the characters in Greenport. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of them. They got together. I mean, George Rosen, Costello, Schoenstein, the list is beyond, I, I don't, I, I couldn't do it justice. But they all got together, and they basically, Steve Clark, they wanted to build this thing, and they got Coast Guard. They wanted to build it in the village, and the village says, not on our property. They wanted to build it in the village instead they of... They wanted to build it right on the railroad, oh. on the Fisherman's Dock that's there now, which was just rebuilt because in the 80s it came in, there was money, whatever. They wanted to build it there, and it was like, no, no, no. So Steve Clark goes, all right, well, summertime, all the boats are in the water. I'll give you a month. You can come down to the shipyard. And damn if they didn't pull it off. They built it in a month. They put it on a barge. They stuck it out there. It built strong, very strong, Mm -hmm. but light. And they put it out there in the the 90s, and, and... It was well celebrated, and it's been celebrated ever since. I don't know anybody who has a little power boat doesn't have a picture of their grandkids or something with this lighthouse in the background. It it Uh is an icon. But it was built to the, you know, specs that they, the amount of money that they had to build it. In the 90s. In the 90s. I mean, final siding. So Tyvek was just coming in. I mean, and then, you know, not for nothing. I've said this a thousand times. They don't put lighthouses where it's nice. You know? No. <laughs> <laughs> so for 33 years or whatever, this has been getting, you know, the stuffing knocked out of it all winter yeah. long. In the summer, the sun baked down on it, and the light has changed. The light isn't. The Coast Guard owns the light. The museum owns the building. And the feds, we we now we found out that we own the rocks, but it's it was a federal part. It's not part of it's not part of the state park. Mm. It's a separate island. And um, one of the things that has saved it all these years is pretty lightly built and pretty porous. So the wind would you know we get wet and the wind would blow in and dry it out and it, it would just. But all good things come to an end. I mean, it's starting to it's starting to get a little long in the tooth. The East End Seaport Museum and Marine Foundation <laughs> has has um, we've gotten together with the local builder and and the foundation has been resurfaced to stop its deterioration. We had a uh, the Gardner Group, uh, the Gardner Foundation. We had consultants come in and they graciously paid for them to do all of our buildings, which is. What needs to be done to keep them in, you know, ship shop? <laughs> a long way to go. Um, <laughs> but they did this survey, and now we have gotten, uh, like I said, started a very serious campaign. To, mm-hmm. And this is, I believe, this is the summer that we'll have the launch of that. And this is the summer that we will really reach out to first, you know, like any capital campaign fund, you know, a thousand dollars here and there, grateful need it but we need some big money first mm-hmm. we need some we need some heavy hitters to come in and say you know we love this thing it's a bit feather in our cap it's, mm-hmm. you know yes we'll put a plaque on there for you but a new dock resheathing the building it's just it, the the cost of all of this is it's gone up in the past well, yeah. 30 years too well okay the cost of doing it has grown up which yeah. is, you know basically it's a 20 30 by 30 summer house you know summer shack yes. but 
<laughs> it's also out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Stuck out in the middle. <laughs> With no electricity, no water. No, I mean, it adds a layer, adds a layer of logistics mm -hmm. that, that can, you know, let's just say that puts another, that puts another O on things, you know, uh, and I'm quite, I'm quite pleased that, that the pieces are coming together. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm dedicating a little more time to that than, uh, the, the museum at this point. Did, because you had, I think it was last year, you were putting together an exhibit that, is it still up, the exhibit currently going on at the, at the, at the museum, there's a there's a number there's a number of different ones. There's a shipbuilding exhibit. There's one on the bunker industry. There mm -hmm. was one on fishing. There was one on uh, uh, there's been a number of number one on oysters. There's mm -hmm. there's a we try to rotate it because it's a small museum and it's good to have some. Into this year, we're going to put some little interesting vignettes within it so that you're coming back and it's fresh. But there is an exhibit on the on the rebuilding of it in 1990 in, if you go to the museum now, I mean, it tells the history, it tells the story of its rebuild and all the fanfare. And I mean, it, it, was, it was a pretty, I mean, they had cannons going off and stuff. I wow. would say it was fireworks. It was, it was a big deal. And uh, unfortunately, times have changed. I don't see that kind of community um, support. Well, not, not support so much, but, but engagement. Mm. You know, I don't see. I mean, when they launched that, like when they launched that thing, I think every business closed in the village, and wow. everybody came. I mean, it was like five hundred people there, or whatever. Mm. It was. A, it was. It was a real tear jerker. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, was a, it was a real, and that's the same time that you know Mitchell Park was being mm. brought in, and I was doing, and uh, to, the architect of the architectural firm that did Mitchell Park are involved in the lighthouse. So, mm. so there's there's continuity here. We have some some real support and some real some real real. It's not like us going, all right, well, I've got a hammer and a nail, and I'm going to go out there and fix this. It's not that. It's the real. We're going mm -hmm. for the real thing. I'm quite pleased, like I said, that, that the progress of that and uh, had a let's say a lot of support. Mm -hmm. A lot of support for that. I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a good thing. And that's that's the major project you have. That's my major, major project. project. That's my major give to the community mm -hmm. for the next. I guess it's going to be two years. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's another two years. Uh, why I do this, I don't know. But uh, you know, I ran for office. I, I, I'm, I'm sort of civic minded, uh, so I. I, I I feel that giving is, you know, but come see the museum. I mean, come down. Mm -hmm. There's some cool stuff going on. There's always, we're always looking for volunteers and people with ideas. I mean, we mm -hmm. are accepting. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, somebody comes in and has, you know, like, join the board. Come yes. in and be a volunteer. You know, I mean, do it's. You, do you have, like, since being there for your time, um, through your time, do you have a favorite? Exhibit that you've had that you put together that you can think of. Yeah, actually, I do have one that I like. We have had, and when I got there, we had a carpenter's toolkit, mm -hmm. and there it was sitting there, and had a piece of plexiglass on top of it, and there was a model on top of that, and I was like, "What's what's in there?" So I took the model off and I went to move it. And it was so heavy, I put a big scratch in the floor. I was like, holy mackerel, what's in there? So, I mean, being alone in the museum, just mm -hmm. no checks and balances, I said, well, let's see what's in here. So I started taking tools out. And it was like a clown car. The tools kept coming out and kept coming <laughs> out and kept coming out. I couldn't believe, I mean, now I knew why it was so heavy. Mm. All of these, I mean, there were beetles and there was saws and planes. And it was just full of, full of these tools. And now I got them all out. And it's like, you know, sort of like Jenga, you know. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> yeah. like, oh, my God, what am I going to do with all of these tools? And I said, well, let's display them. Mm -hmm. Well, um, being in the art field, I'm always interested. I'm always going to different museums and things like that. And there was this one Mexican artist. Uh, I can't remember his name right now. Anyway, he did 
an exploded view of a Volkswagen. Oh. With all, I mean, he did a number of them, but this was yeah. this was one of the pieces that I said, oh, what a great idea. So I bought a roll of uh, rigging wire, stainless wire, which is sort of kind of one of the tools of being repair wire cutters. And I took these boards and I drilled a bunch of holes in them and I put, hung the wires down. And then I hung the tools, almost like a exploded view. Mm. So it shows all the tools. I mean, it's graphically interesting. The tools are all gorgeous. I mean, mm -hmm. really, they're beautiful tools. And that was that was kind of my favorite display. And so that's that's up there in the upstairs in the in one looming in one of the corners. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that's one of my favorites. But uh, yes, the museum has taken a big part of my life. But mm -hmm. I am I'm still doing my artwork. I'm still doing the sailing school mm -hmm. in the summer, which is great fun because you get out there and I can tell you the history of the Greenport from the water. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I try to keep it to a minimum. I you know, start sounding like a you know, vacuum cleaner salesman saying <laughs> the same thing again and again. But, but, you know, people are interested in different things. And, yes. and you know, knowing a little bit about the water, about the fish. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I give people whatever they want. And sometimes too much. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's different. And they get to sail the boat. Which mm -hmm. is much different, you know. You get to drive the boat. You, know, you want to go over there, drive it over there. Mm -hmm. you know, that's and then so it's sort of people get to not only look at the pretty boats, they get to be one. So that's kind of fun. That's Easter, easterlysailing dot com. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so what about separate from the museum? Now that you've been living out here for a while, how has the area changed since? Well, I mean, you grew up in Mattatup, but you've been living out in Greenport since 90. the 90s. So how do you think it's changed from today? To today? To today kind of comparison is... Oh, boy. Well, um, like any like any village, there's, uh, there's attrition. The older people pass on, and with them pass on their houses, change hands, and... There's been, and there's been a real influx of, we would say, summer people. Uh, we would say it, it has, you know, COVID was cool because, well, cool, and, uh, that's a double-edged sword. A lot of people moved out here permanently. Their summer homes that they were fixing all up became their permanent residence. And it has, the population here has changed from local, local kids and local family. It has, the, the the actual demographics have changed, but the demographics have changed because, well, the people who moved out here, first off, have different needs as far as services and things like that. The people who live out here aren't farmers and fishermen. Mm -hmm. Just not. You, know, you probably have, in this village, you probably have 25 writers, 25 artists, mm -hmm. 25 people from, you know, captains of industry. Whatever, you have all many different groups and they have different needs. I mean, all right. <laughs> you know, when I first when I first moved out here the, the biggest problem was like crime and drugs and now our biggest problem is you know leaf blowers. I mean that's pretty good. <laughs> things are pretty good out there. <laughs> that's things. what they're discussing. <laughs> I mean yeah, things have things have changed. I mean the houses are all fixed up and valuable. I mean I I pity anybody trying to young person out here now. I mean, you know, if you're, all right, cool, you get a starter house for eight hundred thousand dollars. I mean, weeks. But that's gentrification. It's mm -hmm. happening everywhere. What I'm hoping for this this village and the new administration, even the old administration, was part of it. I mean, keep the character. Right? I mean, keep the character of the place because I mean, really, with with a blink of an eye, with, with Letting go of the, you know, letting go of that string, place could turn it, could go the wrong way real quick. It could quickly, look like it could, yeah. it could look like anywhere if you start letting them just build generic looking architecture. Or well, I mean, one of the things that saved Greenport wasn't prosperity. It didn't have too much prosperity, so the old houses stayed. You know, when they yes. built them in the sixties, and really, nobody wanted one of these old white elephants. Well, now mm -hmm. people are moving in and they're, you know, 
you're fixing them up. Even the little cottages, and they're, they're all they're, they're charming craftsman cottages, and even some of the ones that slipped in there, they weren't so charming. They're mm-hmm. changing the roof line. There's there's an aesthetic out here that's very nice, but the problem is too many people. It's too many people wanting too much stuff. I mean, it used to be farm stands everywhere. You get groceries, you get, you, you, hey, it was great, you know, money in the box, blah, 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 you know, you know. But who knows what chemicals they dumped on at the time, you know, but we, but we weren't concerned. <laughs> great. Look at that broccoli. Oh. <laughs> but now it's, you know, I mean, now it was kind of organic and all. And that's a symptom that creates a need, that creates an economic driving thing. And it changes the chemistry of, of you know, uh, it changes the uh, the whole aspect of farming. I think it's become boutique farming, the same thing with fishing. Now we're raising oysters in cages. Oh, yeah, some of the businesses are pretty big, and they, they disseminate all over the place. It's not like it was. I mm-hmm. mean, the whole bay was seeded. I mean, the whole, all from New Suffolk to Orient was seeded, you know, mm-hmm. and they dug them up and... But there has been a a real change from exploiting our natural resources, and I believe there's a there's a it hasn't it's you know it's still it's still pretty culturally you know oh save the planet kind of thing. It's not you know when the when when the fan makes noise, there's an awful lot of people who are going to be asking the farmer again. But there's a groundswell of save it, prepare for it, appreciate it, and I. Th- Think that that, um, given the right environment and given the right uh, information, will continue to grow out here. And in many ways, the vineyards saved us in many ways. And, and of course, selling environmental rights, it kept it agrarian looking. Very few of the uh, vineyards are, if they didn't have agritainment or whatever you call it, uh, very few of them would be make a living from their wine. So we have become a service industry out here. Everything is geared towards come look, come play, leave your money, go away. <laughs> you know, it has that kind of feeling. <laughs> but people are just not going away. <laughs> they're, they're staying. After they get them, wait a, minute, wait a minute! You're supposed to go. No, people, people are staying and um, appreciating it and trying to make it their own. And this is where what's wonderful about the museum is it gives people, even though it's most of the stories that the museum have are maritime. Mm-hmm. I, imagine, I imagine an agrarian would have that to it. Exploiting the area, you're exploiting. I mean. You know, take sharper and sharper hooks, you know, you, mm-hmm. each of the stories, but they are history and they are, they do enrich your experience and your cultural connection. You feel, you know, oh, George Washington slept here, kind of, you have that kind of feel to that you have a little bit more that you know about the community. And I think that's really the function of a, of a small museum in a, in a, in a village such as this. Mm-hmm. It's a primer. I mean, the, the real facts and who did what and who did what and who built that, they're there and they should be preserved. But most people want the, you know, you stabbed it with a knife and it carried the bear. <laughs> the bear left his marks on the tree. You know, people want that Daniel Boone story. I mean, we need that urban myth to grow. I mean, just think of all the stupid stuff that we did in America. I mean, Daniel Boone. You know, Davy Crockett and Paul Bunyan, they were all our urban myths that unified us. Mm-hmm. Now they're all uh, woke. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I mean, taking down the statues, mm-hmm. right? They were bad, you know, they did some bad stuff, but, but, but it's an urban myth that creates a unity. Unfortunately, it doesn't unify everybody. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the issue because of the changing of demographics. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I I I don't know. I like I I, I like statues and monuments and mm-hmm. things like that. I think removing them is a mistake. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think correcting them is a good idea. Aunt, uh, Amy had that whole thing about the Indian fighter and all of that. Yeah. So, what a great story! 
put another plaque underneath it. The real facts are, or, or yeah. you know, just, 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 you know, I mean, I just... A lot of it, I think people have some anger, but it, it there's a lot more, it's not so simple as just, oh, take that down and we'll be done with it. There's, whether the, it could be that some of them had still did a lot of good for the community or other things. Like it's always co a complicated thing that it's they just people might want to just simplify. It. Well, they did this, so yeah. That's well, a, that's it's the, the whole. I mean, just think of what happened. To all of the uh, all of the actors and things and the people that were just like, oh man, they they they're people. They're you know they're actors. Or, you know, all of a sudden, they're on the blacklist. I mean, I'm going. McCarthy did that. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you were a communist. Well, oh, you, 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 you know, you, um, you patted somebody's bottom. I mean, it's 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 exactly the same. It's exactly the same thing. It's the power structure that in trying to stay in. It's it's and you know they just what's correct. Mm -hmm. What's correct. I mean, I you know yeah, there's some bad stuff going on. There's stuff that shouldn't be happening, but that doesn't mean that. <laughs> doesn't mean that because people are multi-dimensional. I mean, you and I. I mean, I, there's stuff that I don't want anybody to know that I did. I mean, I'm good. you didn't hear that either. <laughs> um, but but there's you know it's like with this stuff that I did was good. Mm -hmm. So what do you put the plaque up for? Not that I want a plaque, but what do you mm -hmm. what do you put the emphasis on? I mean, that's yeah. that's one of the. One of the interesting things about this research at the museum that I find it is if you look at, you know, the fortunes were made. Well, you know, the old fortune crime thing. <laughs> you heard mm -hmm. that. The fortunes were made out here. They exploited the area. They did the, you know. But like all business and science, because they usually go hand in hand, you, you're doing the best you can with what you got. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you find out later, oh, you know, that wasn't so good. Mm -hmm. But, you know, then you do it better. And, you, yes. and then you do it better. I mean, shoulders of giants. Thing. That's, a, that's the nature of that's the nature of man. The yeah. uh, problem is, is too many of us taking too much. You mm -hmm. know? And they were just, they were just we were starting to realize that we were on a finite situation <laughs> here. <laughs> and not a great trajectory. But at least our, I find our village is maybe because of its socioeconomic whatever there seems to be a positive thought process towards the environment now are they activists or are they pacifists eating organic food you get what you get mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you have a support group it will grow. I mean, look what Cornell's doing. They're doing some wonderful mm -hmm. things. They want. I mean, Southampton College is doing some wonderful things. The local, the local growers are doing some wonderful things. Mm -hmm. But it's still exploitative. It's still, you know, you're still, you know, uh, still my people still might look at it as they're still exploiting. But it's well, it's so it, it's, honestly, it's so small at this point. Yeah. I mean, even the biggest are small. I mean, but aquaculture is. You, it's like an electric car, you know. I mean, it's good and it's bad. There's downside to everything. I mean, they, yeah, they're, they're not going to find something that's. I've been just reading a whole series of books on the fishing industry, and they don't get me started. Really, it's not. It, <laughs> it is just. We'll have to do a separate episode yeah. on the fishing yeah, industry. Let, let me let me get one of our lecturers out here. And let them <laughs> give it, let them give it the right uh, the right uh, spin. Mm -hmm. But it's. It's amazing. I mean, I, what we have done to our, you know, I mean, I have a, my de my screensaver is a picture of, uh, of uh, uh, Rachel Carlson, just to mm -hmm. let you know. And in the, in the in early 50s, she predicted that there wouldn't be any lobsters here because of the warming water. That's it. That was enough. And it wasn't that, oh, we're going to overfish. It wasn't over. an overfish. It was a changing environment. We are mm -hmm. changing. I mean, it was chemicals, and she went, she went mm -hmm. that way. I mean, out here when I was growing up, there weren't any osprey. There weren't. They just weren't here. I mean, but they were blowfish. <laughs> <laughs> Even in Maine, I know that the lobster. I mean, the most they get the lobster up in Canada now. Yeah, yeah. This, this is not. 
And the funny thing is, they, 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 we always think of lobsters, oh, they put the cages down and they just, all those things are crawling on the bottom. Mm -hmm. They bait those traps. They have to bait those traps. Where do you think they get that bait from? South Carolina bunker industry <laughs> they used to be here. <laughs> so, hey, you know, it's a vicious yeah. cycle. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of, I mean, and they're farming. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they are taking everything they can possibly get. Now, they have a limited season and they have, they have an interesting way of regulating themselves. I mean, I'll let somebody else discuss that. I was just reading about that. <laughs> they have an interesting way of doing it. But there's no way that we're going back to the little farm, all the little agrarian farms, that, you know, 30 acre holdings, which is what was out here. Mm -hmm. 30 acre, you know. The reason is, didn't have any irrigation. What are you going to do? You couldn't grow more than you could. Now you have irrigation, you can go 100. But anyway. Yeah, but was the, and then was there anything else that, as we, I asked you about the change, but like, Currently, right now, do you see anything like top three issues or priorities that you feel Greenport should be addressing? I know you mentioned it's expensive for oh, the that's, housing. That's, that's, a, that's a symptom, not a. Uh, that's a symptom. Uh, the things that things that we are not addressing: garbage, sewage, just too much. Hand to man. I mean, mm -hmm. I have uh, my wife. You guys know everybody knows that Mary. She does the. Uh, she's with Audubon Society, and 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 they, South Old Town has done a number of parks, and there's Suffolk County has done a number of parks, and there, and all of these are wonderful. But what land is it? Mm -hmm. You know, all of those areas, there there is no first growth anymore. There's not even I think there's not even any third growth anymore out here. Everything, all these parklands and stuff, are all put in places where it was too hard to develop. Mm. You know, it's like it was too hilly or it was out of the way. Or well, too, too marshy. Or... Too marshy or too and I have noticed that we have rising sea level. Rising sea level creates water weighs a lot. Right? Mm -hmm. It pushes down and it pushes and it pushes the water table up. Mm -hmm. So all these woods are, are kind of the marshy woods are all dying because they're getting feet wet and they're mm -hmm. falling over and stuff. I mean, there's a number of things going on. Change is happening. Change is constant. I mean, one of the things I liked about this village was, and if you go to the museum, you'll see I have a bunch of aerial photographs of this village. Mm -hmm. I mean. If you did this in a time lapse thing, it would be like uh, it would be, the docks would be crazy out here. They'd be there, gone. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just. It would, it yeah. would be, I mean, the place was alive with industry, and everything was moving, and things were moving around, and it was it was pretty incredible. That change is mm -hmm. constant, but it reaches a point where I mean, our village. There ain't nothing natural about our village, is there? You know, okay, you get the sand to go down to the beach, to the water in a couple of places. But there's very little nature. Here. Yeah. We have parks, we have trees that we plant. All of these are excellent, not natural. Mm -hmm. All these parklands, they're wonderful. They put the path through there and you can go through and you can walk through. And it's all very nice, but nature needs to be left alone mm -hmm. just needs to be left to do what it does and a lot of the farming was here even the the inlet pond was was that i think that peggy said that was a farm where the inlet. oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah sure so like a lot of things were just clear cut and put as far like i said everything's like second growth or th well no first growth i mean just to let you know I mean, the Indians used to burn the woods down so there was more room for the deer. Okay, <laughs> this is, this is, this is we, we didn't invent this sort of trick, but I mean, it's been going on for forever. Right. But all the oak forests that were here, I mean, where do you think all these boats that were built, you know? I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean they were getting wood from all over the place, but <laughs> to, or not originally, you know? I mean, I mean it, it, was, it was a resource, mm -hmm. and it was exploited, and it was used. And... You know, there was an occasional lucky tree that got saved and things like that. We planted shade trees. Hedges. Privet. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Privet's a bad thing. 
Those are those hedges. Oh, everybody has a hedge. <laughs> Especially on the South Fork. Well, the South Fork. <laughs> for, now, I'm not sure, but rumor has it that Sylvester Manor in, in Shelter Island. Yes. They were traders and they were doing, they were, there was a, <laughs> they were part of the triangle, the triangle trade. Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. But I heard, and I'd love to find out if this was true, they were one of the first places to actually bring the privet, the plant, the privet from England. Am I right? I don't know, but it's, I mean, it speak about. You know, we have a, we have a farm out here that grows privet as a product. I mean, to be planted. To be planted. Talk about <laughs> service industry. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, and and it's it's invasive in all the woods. And I mean, it, it grows here. I mean, that's a whole story. It grows here. It grows well here. A lot of stuff grows well mm -hmm. here. A lot of stuff that shouldn't be here grows well here. But you know, where's what's invasive? I mean, What's in recent? Do you get rid of everything that didn't grow on Long Island? When? <laughs> when do you say that that's the benchmark? When? Do when you, does that start? When does that start? You know, when it was like 18, <laughs> 15, 14, you know, how do you know? You know mm -hmm. But. What's, yeah, whatever you kind of feels local or wouldn't. The potatoes were local. <laughs> Even though there the, you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I mean, none, none of our crops. You know, I mean, the rhododendron came from Africa. I'm going to say, mm -hmm. you know, South Africa. What do you hope for the future of Greenport? And if you wanted to tie that in for, with the future of the East End Seaport Museum Marine Foundation, what do I hope for the village of Greenport? Well, I hope that the village of Greenport is able to maintain its seafaring roots and its, I mean, right now it has a pretty good industry with uh, the, the marinas and things, but um, they're an ecological disaster. Um, but I think that one of the things that I would hope that since we won't have industry here, we would get some sort of science center, some something Woods Holy mm -hmm. would be ideal to come to this area to ground it in its maritime history. I don't see it. We're, I don't see we're going to be building any tall ships here. I, I, this is not. This is too small a geographic area. Remember, we're a peninsula. You know, we can only go east and we can only draw from east and west. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that we could do some mm -hmm. marine center or something along that line to ground us. And um, I'm hoping we just don't lose our sense of full community, meaning workers, service, owners, Visitors, I mean, mm -hmm. the, the whole thing has got to work because if it becomes only a tourist place, it's, you know, it's another t-shirt shop on the edge of the water. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. it's not, you know, it, it, it's not sustainable. And the people who come here don't really care about it like the people who live here care about it. And I'm, I, I kind of hope, <laughs> oof, this is a bad hope. I hope for a, sort of a, Lack of prosperity. <laughs> We're suffering from too much prosperity, mm -hmm. and I that would the repercussions of that are way more than I want to deal with. But, we but the it's kind of gotten so far that it, the prosperity has gone to where it doesn't. We're losing control of how the community's going and. Just how? To... Yeah. Well, I'm hoping. I mean, I saw that. I don't mean, know. When I ran for office a long time ago, I wanted to get in front of the development and what was going mm -hmm. on because what was happening is we were not. We were a small town. We we reveled in our small townness. We we loved the fact that everybody knew everybody else, and everything. but from the outside, uh, we were a cherry that would. Picked. We were we were rubes, mm -hmm. and 
for a while we held on to that a little bit. You know, we could, but we're not, and and we have suffered a little bit. But hopefully, it's not over yet. You know, and hopefully we'll okay. get sophisticated enough to be able to say no or say yes. I mean, that's the other side of no. We <laughs> <laughs> get to say yes to. Um, I hope. I hope that our village can uh, weather the weather prosperity and be part of the environmental solution, as opposed to um, observers. I mean, I just just. I mean, everybody's doing their part, but it ain't enough. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know what I don't know what enough is. Mm. I, I, I have a water bottle here, a plastic <laughs> water bottle that will be recycled, but that's not the that's not the that's not enough. Well, I, I I want to thank you so much for coming in today, and thank you for your involvement in the community, especially in the East End Seaport Museum and Marine Foundation. And I like that. Keep that in. <laughs> And that's the future. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, definitely go check out the museum. And when does it open? Well, the museum usually, right now, it is, we're going to start earlier in the spring this year, I think. If, you know, I mean, I'm not on the board, so I can't make mm -hmm. a decision, but I can I can offer my influence. Mm -hmm. um, the museum is up and it's, I haven't torn the displays down from last year yet, so it's still <laughs> there. I mean, you could get a peek Go in. check out. Call, call. Call the museum. It's 477 2100. I got to get 631 dating myself, not putting that on there. <laughs> call. See if you can arrange a visit. If you can get a group of people together, turn it in, you know, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Go take a look. They'll turn the lights on for you. Yes. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of fun. Again, I, 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 I'm reaching out for volunteers and for docents and for people who have some information and have some stories to tell. Bring them down. We could, I mean, any input is great. It's not like we have an archive full of things that we're going to pour out and we can't run out of. I mean, there's, there's, you know, seven or eight stories about Greenport, but it's really the people. Mm. And the people is what made Greenport what it is. And, and that I find is what is really interesting about the village because it's 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 a real, it's a cast of characters out here. Yes, <laughs> yes they, we've been out on the peninsula for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, thank you, Chris. This was oh, great fun. Thank you very much. Well, I hope you enjoyed episode twenty-one with Paul Creeling. I want to thank you so much for listening to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast, and we'll see you next time.